Hello, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to Concho, Oklahoma. On behalf of the Shine Rapple Productions podcast, my name is Carrie Whitlow, KK Franklin. Um, today, I serve as the executive director for the Shine Rapple Tribes Department of Education, and we welcome you all here to our our space and happy to have you here. So if we could just go and do a quick introduction of your name, your tribe, uh, your position, and what you do for Tenna. All right, hi, I'm so glad to be here. This is exciting. Uh, my name's Anita Pasatopa, and I am the Senior Ace Specialist with TEDNA, Tribal Education Department National Assembly, uh, in partnership with the Muscogee Nation's Department of Education and Training. And I have three partnered schools that I serve students, and they are Bristow, Sepulpa, and Sand Springs. Thank you. Good morning. I am Kim Stewart Ruman. I am the um, Associate Director and a Specialist Coordinator for TEDNA. And I am Yuchi and a citizen of the Muscogee Nation. Welcome. Good morning. I am Tashina Tadanipa. I am the Senior Education Specialist for the Cheyenne Arapaho Tribes. I'm also Cheyenne Arapaho and Comanche. Um, I have been in partnership with TEDNA and the tribes for about going on 10 years almost. And the partnered schools that we have with the Cheyenne Arapaho are El Reno High School, Calumet High School, Gary High School, Watonga High School, and Sealing High School, as well as uh, Canton. We picked up Canton this year. Awesome. Thank you guys for being here. So I want to go back to Kim and ask you if you can explain TEDNA, what does that mean, and what is that organization? Okay, so um, TEDNA is an organization. So it's the Tribal Education Department's National Assembly. And, you know, we just have our hands in a lot of different things. Um, these ladies work in the ACE grant, which is Accessing Choices in Education. We have um, other grants going on currently, too. Um, our director, Quentin Roman Nose, is very active in making sure that legislatively Native Americans are represented in an appropriate way. He's always going out and um, advocating for um, Native Americans, indigenous people. And so, um, you know, we want to be kind of a hub for anybody that might need something across our nation mm -hmm. that we can advocate for them um, as tribes, as people, as communities. And so just kind of in a nutshell, that's how I would explain what we do. And so TEDNA is an organization that essentially applies for the grants. They create partnerships with different tribes, as Correct. you all have heard mm -hmm. from Muscogee Creek Nation, mm -hmm. Cheyenne mm -hmm. Arapaho mm -hmm. tribes. And why do you think that's important to um, partner with tribes beyond, you know, just a TEDNA organization? And I know in the past they've, they've partnered with tribes outside of the outside mm -hmm. of Oklahoma. So it's all over the U.S. Why do you think that's important? Well, I oh, go ahead, Anita. Okay. Go for it. Um, I feel... Uh, um, the uh, I think it's a good idea or a great idea to, like it, I hate to say that word, bridge the gap, but in, in, you know, in between the local education agencies and the tribal education departments, it's hard for each school in the district to know what resources are available through that tribe for its citizens and its community, for that matter. And Tedna does a really good job of doing that, making sure that. They have people in place, such as the the A specialist, education specialists, mm -hmm. um, in each school site to represent that particular tribal education department, mm -hmm. and it allows us to share resources with uh, all the administration at each school site, uh, faculty, students, and their families. Correct, and then so maybe you guys can highlight your positions and how you kind of bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. And um, adding on to that too, why it's important to be partnered with other tribes is that we're able to. Um, widen that scope. And so right now we currently service, I believe we're at 18 high schools within Oklahoma right now. Mm -hmm. um, so just going back into our position and why it's important for us to be in the schools, I think as representatives um, on behalf of the tribe, we are able to be visible um, within the schools for all of the Indian Ed students that we work with, not just that particular tribe that we're partnered with, but all Indian Ed students that are either on the JOM list or the title listing. So we're able to reach a larger number of students in that capacity. Okay, so this is a question that we always hear. I'm not sure if Muscogee Creek Nation hears this, but let's say we say, okay, Tedna Ace, they partner with these five schools. Well, then we'll always say, get a comment, well, how can we do a partner with this school and that school? So what is your answer and how do you respond to that? Well, 
there everybody's looking at me. I, really <laughs> I, I think I'll, I'll take that one. It's so difficult. that that is difficult because you want to be able to serve <laughs> as many schools and students as you can. And sometimes it comes down to um, manpower. Mm-hmm. Do you have the people, the staff available to go and really do a good job of working with those schools and those students? Um, and that's a lot of the time what it does come down to. And so when we wrote these grants, which I wasn't a part of the original, you know, submission, but you do submit and you are intending to partner with specific tribes and specific schools. And so these are the ones for the most part that were written in originally in that grant. And then, of course, sometimes you're able to expand that a little bit. Um, It's definitely not that we don't want to work Mm -hmm. with all of these other schools. It's really hard for us to say we're not able to do that at this time, mm-hmm. uh, but we do always try to um, point them to resources mm-hmm. that are available to everybody. We still, we still unofficially try to help as many schools and as many people mm-hmm. as we can. Right. And I think um, another thing is that it's, it was based off of the need. Mm-hmm. Like if the school came to the tribe, um, we need more assistance with one-on-one direct services. <clears throat> That's how they became a partner with us. And there was a letter of intent to work with them. Correct. And so for Western Oklahoma, we could probably share that not every school wants to partner with the tribe or with Tedna because they don't think that's important. They don't think that's a need. So the other side of that is the school willing to be a partner Mm -hmm. with you. So I'm not sure if that's how it is in Eastern Oklahoma. Maybe you can share what it's like over there for it is. Um, uh, And a lot of it, uh, you know, beforehand in the writing of the grant process, you know, we have to exactly as she said, think about what schools may need that extra support person, you know, within the school system uh, versus those who already have a large, like, counselor ratio per student. Um, So, and yes, they do have to submit a letter of intent. We do intend to partner with you and allow your personnel to come in the school Mm -hmm. building and access the students during their school day. Correct. So that sometimes is is a barrier. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'll share that I also serve on the Tedna board. So since I've been here at the China Arbor Tribes Department of Education, I've been on the board. I've seen several um, people in your position, Kim. So mm-hmm. I think now you're our third one, which we've had a couple in the past. And I know maybe you don't know the whole history of the grants that they've applied for. And I know Tashina for our tribe had started with that initial NYCP grant. So mm-hmm. maybe yes. you guys both mm-hmm. Nita too that can kind of tell us how many grants that you've worked with with your tribe under Tedna under that umbrella. So me and Anita have been a part of the original um, the original education specialist and we've started out with the NYCP grant which is Native Youth Community Project. Um, we went on into what was the data collection grant and that was during the COVID era. And what we did is we didn't have the time to report out on what NYCP had done. So this allowed more time for us to gather all of our data, all of our stories, the experiences we had in order to promote what we what we found during that time. And then we transitioned into this ACE grant. Yeah, three. And so um, I know I, we don't realize it's been three yeah. grants already, but it just... Building off of that, the very first grant we started with was with middle school kids. So we were working with, was it fifth grade? Sixth grade. Mm-hmm. Sixth on Sixth to ninth grade. Ninth, yeah. And so when we wrote in for the ACE grant, it was easier for us to transition over into the high school because we were already beginning that process. Mm-hmm. And the unique thing about Tedna is that in that first grant with the NYCP program, those students that we had transitioned into our ACE grant. Mm -hmm. So we had 100% uh, retention with most of our students, and we were able to fully monitor them from sixth grade to graduation. So that's been the unique thing with Tedna. And -hmm. then what successes have you seen from that first initial grant? Like you had said, now you're in high school. What what successes have you had and where where you're at now with high school students? Let me get my list. Hold on. (laughs) Now, uh, so that first initial grant, NYCP, uh, the objective was Um, creating an early college and career readiness culture within our school systems and our communities. So we as specialists were able to um, make connections and relationships with the administration and faculty at each school site. And, you know, that includes teachers, counselors. And then we went on to hold like parent engagement nights. So we were 
in the community hosting events and dinners and such and meeting those students' families and creating relationships that way. And then we also went so far as to hold summer camps and reach out to uh, local career path, you know, people, and they invited us into their jobs to see what it was like a day in the life of a certain job that the students were interested in. So we were able to engage in that manner, starting with just the student, the school, and then moving on to their whole family and that whole community. So we developed, a, you know, the groundwork. And then, of course, we went on to the extended data collection where we were able to hone in on what actually transpired and what we actually did with that grant. Um, and, you know, it was amazing. They allowed us um, a whole class period within that school system to teach the curriculum that we developed, culturally appropriate curriculum uh, based on college and career readiness for sixth through ninth grade. Um, so that was a big milestone that we had accomplished. And then, you know, like I said, just also creating partnerships and relationships with local businesses in our prospective um, districts. That was a big one, too. And so from that, we still have those relationships and those contacts with all of those parents, the administration, the local businesses, the community itself. And so, you know, we kind of have made a name for ourselves there. So they're <clears throat> on board for any grant that we want to apply for, especially when it um, aims to help their students succeed Right. whatever their definition of success looks like. Right. But, yeah. Yeah, and then just piggyback off in what she said, um, it's about building that trust mm -hmm. within the communities and with the schools. Um, going inside the schools as an outside entity, we had to be very respectable of what that school was wanting from us and the need and what they asked for initially from the tribes. So um, just being dependable and continuing to do that process and be available to them, it created this relationship that when we went into the ACE grant, we already had that trust and that reputation with that school to where they were willing to work with us furthermore. So just having that and then working in the communities, going out, being visible, that was the main thing, being visible to our communities, being there for our families, and it helped build these relationships to where when we need data, when we need those types of things from students and families, they're willing to do that for us. Mm -hmm. And then, Kim, maybe you want to share what other tribes that you have partnered with in this grant Right now, we have Tashina and Anita, who are mm -hmm. who are our senior education specialists, and maybe tell them how many more you okay. have under the grant and what school districts they work with. Okay. Oh, telling you all the school districts, that may be the challenge. Because <laughs> <laughs> total, we are 18 school districts. And so we have um, Chantel, who um, in the previous year, she and I both had worked with Sovereign Community School in Oklahoma City. Um, so now what she has done since Sovereign is no longer a school, um, she is actually still working with some of those students that have filtered out into like Oklahoma City public schools, still trying to keep communication with them and still trying to be a resource for them and guide them. So we have her, we have Scott Marlowe, who works with Sack and Fox, and then he has three school districts that he works with. Um, he has Cushing, Stillwater, and... North Rock Creek. North Rock Creek, thank you. Yes. And then we have um, Dwight Pickering. He's with the Kiowa Tribe, and he works with um, Riverside and Carnegie. We have Tracy Price, who works with Comanche Nation, and she has, let me stop and re restart my mm -hmm. brain here. <laughs> what schools does she have? She has Apache. Walters, mm -hmm. she has Apache, and she has India Homa. Okay. Did I miss somebody? Mm -hmm. I think that's everybody, so... Well, then maybe you can also share that all of these education specialists, although Tedna is located in Oklahoma City, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily report to Oklahoma City every day. And where are they located and where are they required to be at? Right. So all of them, um, pretty much everybody partners directly with a tribe. Mm -hmm. um, some of them do not. And so they may have an office in a school setting. Mm -hmm. um, like Dwight, for instance, he does partner with Kiowa, but um, Riverside has been nice enough to give him an office space there on campus. And so that's primarily where he reports. And then he travels out to Carnegie. Right. Um, and so we've got, you know, some of them report directly to their tribe, but then daily they are out in their schools mm -hmm visiting those students, talking with school counselors or whoever they might need to work with. Um, and so they are out traveling to their schools nearly every day of the week. 
And then maybe you all can share as education specialists and even Kim, if you'd like to share. But just what do you do on your day to day basis? What does your every day look like? How many students are you seeing? How are you helping them with this grant particular particularly? Well, for me, um, I am actually housed. I have two offices. One office is in Bristow High School and then my other office is at Sand Springs High School. Um, and so I can see a student basically every 30 minutes uh, in their school day. So, you know, we kind of just go over schedules. Um, they'll reach out or I'll reach out or a counselor will reach out and ask if I can meet with a student regarding a certain um, specific thing. Mm -hmm. And with this grant, it's accessing choices in education. So it's primarily um, focused on their path, their career through high school and beyond. Mm -hmm. So helping them um, develop that plan upon graduation, um, following through with the steps needed for that plan, making sure that their family is, you know, on board with it or that they are confident in their choices that they're about to make mm -hmm. regarding their future. Um, I think that's a really important aspect of, of this grant is that some students, you know, they, they're 15, 16, 17. They don't necessarily have that that confidence, who knows, you know, you don't, you can't ever just exactly know, mm -hmm. you know, the right path to take. And so we have assessments. Um, we partner with so many entities, ACT, uh, WIN, um, College Board, uh, State Regents for Higher Education. We have all these partnerships that we have access to resources mm -hmm. so that we're not just there telling them our opinion. That's mm -hmm. not what we do. We don't go there and say, we think you should do this based on what you've told us. That's not how we do that. Um, they tell us their dreams and goals um, and their family kind of dynamics, you know, what their environment looks like it, you know, somewhat mm -hmm. so that we can kind of assess um, professionally, you know, what path, what options they have available to them per their tribe, per their local, um, per their family, per everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then we kind of develop a plan and then we help them put that into action and make sure that they kind of stay on course throughout their high school career. And it's, you know, we're just that extra support person. I know counselors do a lot in their high school, school districts, but I think it's almost impossible mm -hmm. for them to know every grant or scholarship or resource available for their Title VI and Native American students. And right. that's where our specialty comes in. We do. Right. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, that's, and I think just helping them feel confident or be sure of their choices and all of the choices they have available to them. That is what we do. One of the things that I wanted to, as Anita was talking, kind of occurred to me. Um, one of the things that I think our specialists bring to the table, um, that I appreciate about them and I think students do is they all share their personal experiences that their path was not necessarily always a straight path to I finished high school, I went to college, I got a degree, I, you know, right. they share their own personal journey that everybody's was a little bit different. And yes, yeah, some people may have had that direct path to what they wanted to do, and some did not. And so I think that makes it um, more attainable mm -hmm. for students when they can realize that it's not just one way that you get there and you might not take the easy way. Yes, you may take a harder path to get there or you may need more support, um, just whatever it is. And I really appreciate that about our specialist is they they are pretty genuine and real and share their experiences as appropriate with students to kind of help them understand that um, that, yeah, this is this is going to be a journey for you. And we're here to kind of help get you, you know, moving in the right direction on that. So I think that's one a, a great asset that all of our specialists bring to the table with this program. Absolutely. Yeah. So for my particular site, it varies <coughs> it different from Anita. Um, the fact that uh, Concho is home base for me. So I do have an office here within the education department. However, I'm partnered with six different high schools. And that's kind of creating a schedule where I'm allowed to go to those schools um, the travel itself, though, getting to those schools, we do have a lot of rural schools under our on our listing, but it's building that relationship with those schools and being visible. So once we set a date or a time that we're going to be there, it's important that I do make communication or I make attempt to be there that day to help work with those students. And a lot of the times when I do get there, the first thing I do is I interact with my counselors. I sit down, we talk about anything that's happened recently, we talk about things going on with the students, and that kind of gives me 
um, an update of what's going on and who I need to poll, who I need to talk to. So these sessions can be in groups or they can also be one-on-one. It just depends on how that student's feeling, um, what they've accomplished within that that week or that month, and then where we pick up and continue to go on with them. Um, One of the biggest things I've been doing recently is a lot of collaborations with tribal programs. So I've been collaborating with a lot of our health programs, bringing them out as speakers, because I do think it's important to create that relationship within the tribe with our programs so they have access to our students as well and to bring awareness out to them. But it's also um, allowing the students to know that they have other options, opportunities, And then another thing that we're doing is trying to highlight more college trips Mm -hmm. um, outside the state of Oklahoma, just to kind of expose them to something new, see if they're willing to make that jump, and then kind of prepare them for that. But also connecting them with um, colleges, careers, things in state as well. So just having that plethora of resources that they can kind of go through Mm because they have a set mindset of what they want to do when we first meet Mm -hmm. them and then as the year goes through as we give them more resources or we've talked with them those often change so then we have to help them prepare so I I often tell people they ask us you know what do you do as senior education specialists and then in simplicity that what we do is make sure that our students have a plan post-graduation and then to add on to what Kim had said and I'll start with Tashina but why do you think it's important that you share your personal journey and why do you why why do you think it's important for these students to know for me in particular <clears throat> being a tribal member tribal citizen of the Cheyenne Arapaho I'm able to connect with my own tribal members as well but also giving my own experiences out to these students to let them know that like she said we don't necessarily transition right into college or they can relate to us. That's mm-hmm. the biggest thing for them to be able to relate to us because they often see these counselors, these professionals, and they don't feel open to them. Um, one of the main things that I tell them is I'm not a teacher. I'm an education specialist. And the difference in that is that my job is to make sure that I give you all the resources that you need. And I'm one of those resources, mm-hmm. telling my story, letting them know that it wasn't always ABC type of thing, that there's all these different things that can affect or impact your decisions the challenges, the barriers, and just let them know that, you know, we understand that, and then to help them get through those transitions. I think she said it perfectly. (laughs) (laughs) She did. I think you guys Um, show them what resilience mm -hmm. looks like when you share your stories, and that's something that a lot of our kids, I mean, they're kids. Mm -hmm. Yes. They have yet to really experience and learn what resilience means, and I think they really embody that, this Mm -hmm. team does. And I think it's, uh, some of our students are shocked to know that Tashina and myself are currently enrolled in college and taking courses to, you know, better our careers or better our personal self sense of worth or accomplishment. Yeah. And, uh, especially at our, at, at my age, <laughs> um, you but, don't have to share your age. Okay. That's, I was just about to go there, but, fine, nah. no. but yeah, so it is comforting, I think, to students to know that it's not just a, a, a to Z path. There's so many different pathways mm-hmm. you can take and that, you know, life happens, and sometimes it's just not um, a degree doesn't have to be the ultimate goal. It, it doesn't in some cases, and there are other pathways that they can take, and it's just comforting for students and families to get to hear all of those different pathways and resources and choices instead of just thinking, like Tashina said, that mindset, okay, I have to graduate and I have to go to college immediately. Mm-hmm. Right. It's not always that. That's, you know. And it's okay if you don't do that. It's okay. Yes, exactly. It's relieving to them to actually hear that from somebody who already has a career, who's already, you know, their definition of success or what they have. Absolutely. Yep. And I do want to share that Kim is a former public school administrator, teacher, principal. So, I mean, and this question is for all of you all, but why is it important that we have this additional support, whether it's grant, Title VI, JOM, Impact Aid? Why is it important for this funding for American Indian Alaska Native students? Why is it important for us to have this additional support, resources, whatever it may look like in your opinion, in your experience? I think we need to be able to um, provide them with every possible opportunity every possible way, resource to um, accomplish whatever it is they're looking at doing. And it's like Anita talked about, it may be 
if they're, it's a college degree, it may be you go out into the workforce, it may be that you're helping support your family, whatever success looks like for you. Um, but I think it's important to have that funding to kind of level the playing field, to be real honest, right. is what it is. Um, and and it, expand on that. What do you mean by level the playing field? Well, For our listeners who maybe don't right. have any comprehension of what that means. And, and part of that leveling the playing field is um, not even knowing the resources that are out there and available to you or thinking they're not available to you because you're not going to a tribal college or you're not going to whatever we want to level the playing field by um, giving them all of those opportunities because there will be plenty of reasons why they are not feeling like that is something that they can go out and do. Maybe they've got, you know, family issues, things that they have to overcome. Maybe they have, you know, um, I don't know, girls jump in and help yes. me. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I got to say think, my words. Um, it's personal for me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my personal journey from high school to now is uh, definitely the reason why I'm in this career field. Um, in high school, I, for, for whatever reasons, a plethora of reasons, uh, I didn't feel that I had the permission to succeed. And I say that all the time in my speeches. Um, but it's just a fact, you know, um, low income housing, single family income, single parent, just all the roadblocks to success that a student might encounter, um, you know, kind of happened. In the, and it happens today to, 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 to students. And so, and like Kim said, not knowing the resources that are available to you as a student and a family uh, in that community, um, that's just an even bigger fail on a lot of people's parts. Um, so this, this extra support is most definitely important to allow students to realize they do have that permission to succeed, regardless of their current circumstance and their situation. Um, it's not always going to be that way. And it's really hard for 16, 17, 18 year olds to have that realization unless they have somebody telling them that it's so. So it's really important that we have all these extra support programs in place and people to help, um, you know, lift them up and mm -hmm. show them. There are opportunities out there, and there are several, right. and here's how to get there. Right. Absolutely. I think when we talked about <clears throat> leveling leveling the field, you know, a lot of these students, when we go in to see them, they're not a part of any athletic events, not clubs or anything. And then just for us to be in there working with them, they're being seen. Mm -hmm. And for them to be a part of something that they can help, um, that's going to help them and benefit them in the end. And just for us to be working with them, I think it gives them a sense of belonging. And when we talk about this grant in particular, a lot of the stuff we do is culturally related as well. And so it gives them a sense of their identity. And so just having that belongingness and being able to connect with us and then um, building that trust and that relationship with us, I think it helps them grow as a person and then prepare for whatever is after graduation whether it's career or going into education, but I think just for them to be a part of something and to be seen and to be, and to know that, you know, they're important. And so I think that has been our impact really over the years working with Tedna. Absolutely. And you guys do some great things with your funding, um, which I, maybe you guys want to elaborate on. What do you give your students? I mean, what have you given them? Because, I mean, they have federal money, not gaming money, tribal money. <laughs> I mean, they've got money, so they are able to give incentives to their students. And what does that look like? What are you providing to them if they sign up with your program? Well, okay, let me go. Um, <laughs> so we have several options available to them. Um, there are technology packages, um, laptops, Chromebooks, hotspots, ACT calculators. Um, we also partnered with ACT, and we have ACT fee waivers for those people who cannot afford that, you know, $75 test fee up front. Um, we know a lot of the GOM programs do uh, a reimbursement type program, but that kind of, I think, defeats the purpose of I can't afford to take the ACT up, you know, right. I, it's a right. lot of money. But anyway, so we do have uh, ACT fee waivers for those students that need that. Um, and then we offer college and career counseling, you know, in group settings or one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then, of course, college career tour slash trips where we will um, take a charter bus and uh, go visit different colleges and take a tour and um, 
participate in activities that are on campus uh, during that day or, or the, you know, the two days that we go. Um, and then, yeah, go yeah, and then yeah. within recent years, we've been offering our summer camps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And these are either <clears throat> um, education-related or culturally related. Mm-hmm. So for our particular site here in Cheyenne, Arapahoe, we were able to collaborate with a lot of different tribal programs, especially our culture and heritage program. And they came in and just basically was really, really ingrained in Cheyenne Rapo culture. And for our particular area, even if that student is not enrolled with us or particularly a part of this tribe, we were able to expose them um, so they understood the culture, place-based learning, where they live at and who they're associated with in this area. So just being able to give those resources out, um, any incentives that we have, these parent meetings that we have. Now, we call them parent nights. However, they should be labeled as family nights. Um, Mm -hmm. Our particular program here believes that it's not just a student and their parent. We have to also include the families because what we're doing with that one student trickles down into the younger generations within that family. And so just offering these services, these resources, and being available. Once they contact us and they're like, you know, I need help paying for this fee or um, are you guys have any college trips coming up? It's our job to make sure we connect them in the right spot. And also, um, Tedna does, in some instances, pay for concurrent enrollment fees okay. um, for those tribes, citizens that do not live within their jurisdictional boundaries. Sometimes the education department does yes. not assist in, the, in those. So Tedna does pick up that slack for that student and their family. And then we've also taken um, tricks. Trick trips. <laughs> we do. We do tricks. I got magic. Um, no, we. Um, <laughs> my first mess up. We take trips to uh, different conferences for our students, uh, such as this past summer we went to the Unity Conference, and that was in Washington D.C. And we had a blast with the students, and they actually learned a lot and were engaged and. Um, or involved with several of the activities that were held by the Unity Conference. We've done the NIEA student days as yes. well. Yeah, we've yeah. had several <clears throat> do that too. So, yeah, I think that the, um, I know lots of high schools do those college tour trips. Um, and I think those are really valuable for kids that just haven't, haven't even seen a college campus, mm-hmm. have no idea the thought of it might be too scary and overwhelming, but maybe once you set foot on campus and you meet people that work there and they are genuinely happy to see you there and they they want you to come to their school, right. mm-hmm. um, I think that just sparks something in a lot of kids. Mm-hmm. I always share my personal story about going to college was really a result of going to JOM summer camp. And it was on the campus of East Central University in Ada. And, um, you know, I'd kind of thought about college but then being on campus there and seeing it and meeting people kind of made it just this reality for me, something that I thought, okay, I think I can do this. And so it did spark something in me. And I see that with a lot of kids too. That, um, And that's why we try to go to a variety of places because it, this one place for you may not really mm-hmm. connect with you, but you may go to another college campus and feel like, oh, yeah, I like it here. Even if it's as simple as it's really pretty here and yes. this is where I want to <laughs> yeah. go. You know, these are teenagers. And so but sometimes it's the people they meet while they're on campus, right. too. Exactly. And we and know that college isn't always their path. Yes. But they don't know if it is or isn't until they really explore that option sometimes, mm-hmm. too. And so we just want to give them that option there. And one of our summer camps is actually held on uh, the College of Muskogee <coughs> Nation campus. We've partnered with them, and they are gracious in giving us space uh, mm-hmm. for two days to hold a camp, you know, for five hours each day. And they offer us, um, you know, uh, breakfast and lunch and things like that through their cafe. And so the students really get to experience what it's like to be on a college campus um, they do throughout the, the day. And, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and, what, and what college campuses have you all visited so, so within the past year, we've gone up to Haskell Indian Nations University. Um, we were welcomed over to Kansas University as well. And then we recently took a trip to Kansas State University. Mm-hmm. And then within the state of Oklahoma, I know we've done trips to UCO, um, events over at OU, uh, Muskogee. Muskogee. OCC, Oklahoma City. Yeah, yeah. so we've done. Cameron. Mm-hmm. And then I know Swasu was on our list to start getting students out there as well. So we just have. A lot of different connections, but I think outside of Oklahoma, we've done a couple. 
So I am just really grateful to work with you all um, and work with Kim on the board, the Tedna board, and work with Tashina for the past however many years we've been here. It feels like it's gone by really mm-hmm. fast. But I do want to share that with that initial NYCP grant, um, I had a nephew, uh, his name is Marlon, and I remember seeing, going to one of their family nights, and they had the me posters. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. seeing seeing him, seeing him participating, seeing what he wanted out of life. And this was when he was in sixth grade, so it was that very first grant. Mm-hmm. I remember going, and a lot of those students have now graduated. They moved on. They, they're in college. And so I just want to share that, you know, and I worried about him because he's mm-hmm. kind of goofy and, you know, mm-hmm. you just don't sometimes know, but you want the best for them. Um, but I do want to share now, he's at high school. Yeah. He's in his, you know, he's a sophomore and he's going to graduate this yeah. spring with his associate's mm-hmm. degree. And so I do say that there is success coming when you have that additional support. And sometimes it may not be all 30 kids. It may be one or two, but that's still success. And so I think everything that you all are doing is worthwhile. It's impactful. And I just want to wrap, with, wrap up with you all sharing what is success mean to you in this work that you're doing as a senior education specialist when where you started what does that mean for you and your students and your families I think for our particular area here in China Arapaho country is that our success can be measured about um, by how welcome we are in these communities you know sometimes it's hard to get these parents to participate these students to participate as well as the school being in support of what we're doing. And over the years, we have built these relationships. And for a lot of the times, that relationship didn't exist between the tribe and the school. And just to be that person that, you know, we've had these stable grants over the years, and we were able to go in and we have the data. We show that we worked with these students. There are success stories in here and that what we're doing has a meaning and that there is a purpose to everything that we do with these students. And I think that's our biggest success is just being having that reputation to be able to come in and be trusted. Right. Absolutely. I think that um, my definition of success is I really watching a student go from being so unsure of the next step in their life to having a plan of being confident in that and knowing that that's a choice that they're making and that they can always have a plan B and change their mind. That's, I think, and just being confident in that, watching them go from, oh, I don't know, to, oh, yeah, we're about to do this. It's fit and they go down. <laughs> that's it. That's Absolutely. a success for me. Okay. Um, for me, gosh, success as a whole with this team is um, seeing, the, seeing the impact that they're making everywhere and that we've got – Um, schools that want to be a part of this program and um, adding on, you know, specialists and tribes and the growth that we are making. And then, you know, true success in my mind would be people wanting to carry on this work, Mm -hmm. regardless of whether the grant money continues to be there or not. It doesn't mean we won't continue to apply for that grant money. We have every intention of doing that. But then if for some reason it's not available, we want tribes and schools to want to continue this work and to try to find ways to continue it and um, maybe still partner with Tedna, but maybe continue the work on their own is what we would hopefully want to see to continue there. Right. And I do want to add that grants are important. <clears throat> and I think sometimes people who don't understand grants think it's just free money. It's yes, it's, a it's lot free of work money, with but it. it's a lot of work, <laughs> yeah. a lot of work. And it, it doesn't last forever, right? Right. So it is our responsibility as a tribe, education department, school district, Mm -hmm. like you said, to to sustain that work, sustain their jobs. Um, So the data is important. Mm -hmm. Success that you guys are finding is important, not only for those school districts, those families, but also for leaders, your tribal Mm -hmm. leaders, and showing them, here, this is what I'm doing, Mm -hmm. being visible. Oh, well, we know who Tashini is. We know what schools that she works with. It it matters, especially here in western Oklahoma, because I don't know what it's like in eastern Oklahoma, but western Oklahoma, even with our school districts, when I started here, we had a handful that were still, you know, a lot of mistrust with the tribe, and our students don't need your help. They're fine, but like she said, over the years, we've built those relationships. Mm -hmm. There's trust built, and now they're wanting to seek Mm -hmm. partnership with us. 
And then same with Tedna. I know there's tribes that wanting partnership with mm-hmm. Tedna because they know they're bringing opportunity to tribes, there's families mm-hmm. and students and school districts. So um, I just want to say I appreciate what you all do. And remember that these ladies don't see each other every day, maybe on a Zoom meeting, but they're in their respective communities and school districts doing their jobs and what they're supposed to be doing for their grant. But um, I thank you all for coming all the way out to Concho, Oklahoma, Western Oklahoma. I know it's a drive, but um, thank you for, for coming. Thank you to Shine Rapper Apple Productions for having them. And if you all want to say anything or... Um, just, just, you know, <laughs> relaying into what we talked about, sustaining these efforts. Um, Tedna has been making that jump as far as being a consultant, presenting on our findings, and kind of being more available to... Um, anyone who's willing to listen and what we've been finding and the techniques that we've used in these schools and just being there as a resource for other tribes as well. Absolutely. And I just kind of want to give a a real shout out to Miss Jordan Stewart over here. She's our communications specialist for Tedna and without her guidance and knowing of all the goings on on the on the net on the line (laughs) we would have no clue what to do i mean you know i'm getting up there in age and so technology is not always my friend but i always get a hold of jordan and she's like i got this boom yes send it back to me here here it is done and you can follow (laughs) tednet on instagram Mm -hmm. facebook that's it for right now but Mm -hmm. t-e-d-n-a so thank you all thank you for having us hawk um cap and we will end it (laughs) 